Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Four peas in a pod here, really, isn't it? Just, <laughs> just the same gener a generation of nerds who decided to lift weights. <laughs> hey, welcome to Health Oddity Podcast. It's episode 22. Thanks for joining uh, the podcast yet again. Um, we're very excited today, as we always are, but particularly today because uh, I've got someone very special on board uh, who's going to take us through quite an extraordinary journey, not only in his own, through his own life, but what he does for other people. Before I re reveal who that guest is, please say hello, James. How are you doing? Hello, James. How are you doing? <laughs> hey. The same every bloody week. Uh, Peter, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing all right. Thank you very much. Okay, good, good. So welcome to Health Oddity. Uh, as we always say, please do subscribe to the podcast because it does help us and it allows us to get a wider reach and bring you the guests that are going to help you uh, achieve your health goals and inform you with some of the best information out there. And this week is no different. We've got the one and only Paul McElroy, strength coach. Uh, for me, I've come across Paul's work for many, many years, and it just took me down a crazy rabbit hole, which has been an exciting journey in my own career, but also an exciting journey for many of my clients. So Paul, welcome to the podcast. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's lovely to be here. And that rabbit hole you've, you've been dragged down is where I live, 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a bit cramped down there. There's four of us in it now. One There's, is no light. Light. There's no light at all. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> apart from your winning smile, that's it. It lights up the room. It does. But, uh, no, it's great to be here, guys. Um, any yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So okay. let me, uh, well, a little quick introduction, really. So Paul... Paul has got a reputation within the strength community of doing not only crazy things in terms of feats of strength, but also crazy things to other people's bodies. And I've been trained by Paul for the last year. Uh, I run one of his programs called The Amazing 12 with my clients as part of what we offer our clients. A lot of trainers have just started seeing some crazy things on the internet, maybe five or six years ago, maybe even a bit longer and uh they were not only these feats of strength that paul could maybe get into uh recently paul completed 40 presses with a single arm a single arm kettlebell press 40 times with 40 kilos at 40 years of age it's an insane feat but that's just one of many many feats of strength but also if you type in the amazing 12 into the uh into the internet into the world wide web you start getting pictures of people making crazy transformations in 12 weeks taking them from where they are which could be just a normal everyday uh, gym goer to what looks like fitness models but not only that they are themselves completing great feats of strength not only from deadlifts squats kettlebell work across the board is some crazy stuff so we're all kind of geeks you've got four people who are geeks and paul's the super geek because paul knows <laughs> everything. i mean uh, there's not a certain there's not a question that i've not put to you that i had an answer for and a detailed one so a lot of uh, a lot of trainers are going to be interested in what you say but really this podcast is geared towards uh, the everyday gym goer who who's just never been exposed to some of these ideas and paul mm. you know it's great to have this forum where we can really let you explain to to our audience kind of how to do it correctly really because you really do um Thank so um if i could ask one question is you know where do you come from why are you <laughs> able to do this stuff <laughs> what do you want with us on here on earth <laughs> um yeah well i come from belfast here um and but sometimes i feel like i come from another planet and say my own head because it doesn't work um, the same way we're told normal does. And so from, from, from the earliest age, I have had an ability to spot patterns and to see um, mathematics and geometry in everything, in everything. And sometimes it gets annoying, but I learned to channel it. I also have a somewhat photographic memory, right? I, I like the joke that we're halfway between Rain Man and Will Hunting. 
somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the gray area. Not quite as good as either, but just sort of weird. Um, but yeah, I do have an ability to retain a lot of information and to become hyper focused on whatever catches my interest and to really delve into that and to see the building blocks of it and how to simplify it and how to progress it in what I perceive to be the most optimal way manner or the most optimal manner possible even. Um, and literally sequentially in my life, it started off, you know, superhero type stuff. And then it moved to like dinosaurs. And then it moved to, in my early teens um, to boxing and combat sports. And then it, 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 that sort of simultaneously um, formed my interest in strength and conditioning, which actually started back when I was obsessed with heroes and Conan the Destroyer and all those things as a kid when my older brother had bodybuilding books and magazines. And I got to see that Arnold wasn't just a cartoon character or there wasn't some sort of special effects going on that he really did look like that and really was a human being who was physically strong and, uh, and looked like He-Man who I was obsessed with as a kid. Okay. So <clears throat> all these things led my brain towards becoming a strength and conditioning coach. But the amazing 12, funny enough, kind of came about by accident. It kind of came about by default in a way. Um, yeah, it did. And is it, it so? I mean, there's quite a, a, a kind of uh, amazing story behind the program uh, because you start, you it kind of had roots in you just helping someone, didn't it? Mm, who, yeah. Who was struggling with their own journey. Yeah. It was a, a friend of mine um, from when I was boxing as a teenager, it was a multiple, a multiple Irish champion, a very talented boxer who. Like a, like a lot of kids, I mean, I come from what was essentially an urban ghetto, which was also at the time, unfortunately, in the middle of a war, like a war zone type scenario. Um, so there was a lot of um, deprivation, a lot of poverty, a lot of, a lot of death, a lot of violence. Violence kind of became part of the culture. You know, you know the, the fighting Irish thing always was a thing anyway and, and remains a thing and always will be a thing. It's, it's cultural, it's genetic. You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, who knows, but there's a whole batch there right now and nobody really knows what to do about it. It's just the Celtic nature to be that way, but also be lighthearted with it. But where I was from, it took on a very dark twist because it was just such a dark situation. And... There was many opportunities, like as there always is in, you know, social deprivation scenarios like that, to go down the wrong road. And my friend had went down the wrong road, and had ended up a sort of a, a substance abuse victim, essentially. And he had fallen on hard times. And my this this coincided. I had lost touch with him, to a certain extent. And this kind of coincided with my father becoming terminally ill and literally being on his last days in hospital. There was nothing more they could do for him. And like a typical, you know, man of his generation, particularly an Irish man, was just like, I'm going home. <laughs> take, the, take these needles out of my arms. Take these. Well, Doc, how much are you going to extend this by? A few weeks, right? I'm going home. It's as simple as that. I would rather die on my terms, you know? So in that, I said, look, listen, daddy, give me, give me, give me a couple of days. Give me a few days to just try and do something. I don't know where this came from. I was only, well, I thought I was a man, but I was only a kid about in my mid twenties at the time. Um, early mid twenties. And I just got this overwhelming desire to fix up his apartment. <laughs> it's flat. I, I, I'm used to talking to Americans, so I say apartment, a flat, right? <laughs> okay. It was essentially a flat. Um, and to, to fix this up, just the best I could. And I was struggling. I, I, I was doing my best, but I knew that, that this guy, this friend of mine, was actually a really talented um, painter and decorator. And he was, he was renowned for being super fast. He is literally whatever he turns his hand to, he's brilliant that very naturally talented, you know. And I and he cleaned his act up for a few days. 
and it really, really did. And we transformed that apartment. And my father came home and was able to, was absolutely gobsmacked. It was like something out of changing rooms, you know, you come in and, and, and it, it meant up the world to me that he'd done that. And on the night that my father died, oddly at almost the same time as the police report would later reveal, my friend was again drunk because there was no need to, to hold off anymore. And he was sat upon by a number of people in the early hours of the morning. And they put his knack on a curbstone and jumped on it like, uh, like the movie American History X. Um, well, something similar to that. And they I mean, there, there, it was attempted murder. There's no way they were just trying to beat him up. They left him for dead. When the ambulance found him, they thought he was dead. Like, you know, um, his neck was, he had, he had a compressed fracture vertebrae and breaks in two or three different places in his cervical vertebrae. He was millimeters away from being paralyzed for life or so we were told. Um, and for some reason, I just had the overwhelming desire to save after I lost my father. And particularly for this individual who had been a friend anyway, but had paid, played a pivotal role in making the last days of my father's life special. I knew about Body for Life, right? When there's a blast from the past, but everybody here remembers the, the muscle media pretty, magazines and Bill yeah. Phillips. Yeah. And they give it, you know, the whole the whole body of work thing where he, he sells the, the Lamborghini and buys 10 Corvettes and makes them all champions. And out of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in America, um, you know, these 10 people won. And they're, they're, it was a 12 week before and after transformation. And the transformations were dramatic, like super dramatic. I remember trying to enter it when I was 18. It was like the first year it was out. And it was, <laughs> are you a resident of the United States of America, sir? I'm like, no, no, I'm sorry, you're ineligible. So I wasn't able to do it, but I always followed it. And I always knew about it. And I always knew that there was something which plays to your point that you were talking about, um, I think off camera. And I'm not sure if you mentioned that on camera but the inextricable link between a physical transformation and the mental emotional transformation that comes with it it's profound and it's every time you know and i'll get into why that is but for now i knew the body for life had this way of changing people of turning their life around not just their body and i didn't know if it had come to the uk or ireland or anywhere but i knew that if it had it could help them and that i could help them because my only skill set at that point was knocking people out and getting people stronger, you know? And I'm pretty sure <laughs> the first one was not, wasn't applicable, right? So the second one, I had never applied to an aesthetic purpose, you know? I'd never applied it to an aesthetic purpose at that point. And I knew that the rules were slightly different as well. Well, the rules, the rules are the same. And the loading parameters and, and what you do, the variables are the same and how you manipulate them is slightly different, but that's it. Um, so I knew it was simply a mathematic equation to be worked out. So we didn't use the Body for Life program, but we, we, we entered him in the Body for Life competition. Um, it was touch and go whether or not he was going to be able to walk. But there was this like real seminal moment in the hospital where I'm there with him. You know, and we're both emotional and he's saying, praying to God saying, you know, if he lets me walk again, if something, if I can possibly walk again, if, 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 there, if anything transpires where I can walk again, I'm going to turn it all around. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. I'm going to sort myself out. I'm going to do this. And I was just praying with him. It turned around almost miraculously, as they say, after that point, his recovery just sped up like an inexplicable way. You know, he started getting really positive mentally. And then I got positive and it became like a sort of a, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy, like a snowball effect. And he got out of the hospital and I says, well, I found out that this thing, Body for Life, told him about it, showed him some of the videos, um, like a VHS that I had had from the 90s, um, a body of work it was called, the documentary about it. And he was like, right, we're going to do this and we're going to win it, Right. I had no clue if we were going to win it. I honestly didn't fancy our chances of winning it, really. But I knew that wasn't the point. I knew that if I could get him to go through the process, there would be something emotionally transformative about the physical transformation. And that hopefully that would help him get a bit of perspective 
on the right way to live and treat himself and think about himself. And that's what we did. And he won it. <laughs> right? He won it. He won the whole thing. Amazingly, you couldn't script this. It was like something out of a movie. And he was working full time. He went back into painting and decorating um, and didn't drink, didn't do any of that, didn't touch any of that. It was absolutely like a Shaolin monk level of dedication to this thing. And he started even before I wanted him to. He had a neck brace on and he was squatting. Yes. Right? Now, I'm not going to advise that to anybody out there. <laughs> yeah. I was complaining about my wrists yesterday. Yeah, no, no. Maybe this is... <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Maybe this is shed some light. <laughs> yeah, there's levels. Maybe this is maybe this is shedding some light on the lack of empathy that I often show when uh, <laughs> and about certain things. But no, listen. The issues that you have are there anyway. You know whatever it is. So that's not going to change. The only thing that you have control over is your perspective on them. Now, with that in mind, I didn't want him to start squatting with the, with the neck brace on. But I think in his exact words was, then you can go and I'm going to do it anyway. So I thought, right, well, it's better off doing it with a spotter. So, so off we went. Um, and, you know, I was, I was still working as a strength and conditioning coach in the gym that I ended up later buying and owning and all that. And, uh, and we were doing this. Oftentimes, we couldn't get to that gym because it was closed. And I didn't have keys because I was just I was just working there. You know, the owner was very the, the original owner was very he was the original owner for 50 years. And he was an old man in the 70s. He didn't get a key to anyone. So we had a key to another gym, but the main gates would close and they were covered with barbed wire. And and like at 12 o'clock at night, sometimes 11, 12 o'clock at night, we would climb over this fence, throwing a coat over the barbed wire, climbing over the barbed wire to get into a gym, to open it with a key, to go in and train at night time and then lock it up and come back and go home. Like these were some of the things that we did to do this. And he won, do you know? Now, it's not, it's not to say that you necessarily have to do all these things and that if you don't, you know, if you sacrifice all this and you don't get what it is you want at the end of it, that it was, it was pointless. Do you know, if he hadn't won, it was still the point of doing what we did to change his perspective on what it was to live life and what he was capable of, you know? And that was the, the first time I'd ever transformed somebody in 12 weeks and the result was, was incredible. Um, and we put that, a friend of mine wanted to do a website for me. Um, and in, in the, about 15 or 18 months in between that, it was all over like newspapers and he was in fitness magazines and he was even on a radio show, I think at one point about the, the, the body for life one. And when that went out there, a lot of people from the old neighborhood who grew up with me and grew up with him, who were on the same boat as him, just came to me. And I wasn't even living there anymore. And they were coming to my mother's house <laughs> and saying, here, where's your Paul? Do you know, you know, all like real, like, you know, like people who needed help. Do you know, and, and seeing the transformation, not just the physical transformation, but seeing the change in this guy. He never wasn't going out anymore. anymore. There was a spring in his step. He was constantly smiling. He was constantly happy. There was sunshine again, no matter what room he went into. They seen that and that's what they wanted. It wasn't about the six pack. Do you know, that's great when that happened. You know, and he gained something like 25 pounds of muscle. It was an insane transformation. Like it's not, it shouldn't even be possible what he did. You know, most of that was his legs. He was so dedicated to the squat. It was insane. Um, and the program that I put him through was a bit different even than the program that's around today. Um, I wouldn't even expect people to do some of the stuff that he was doing, you know, but it worked for him. It worked for, and he was a bit of a freak athlete as well. You see, you must understand that. And he was so driven um, and in his 20s at that time. So there's a lot of factors involved there. But I ended up transforming a lot of people, doing it kind of pro bono, friends and family, people. It was, it was almost like something that became known and was spread, you know, and it was like, we, we hear of a man and they would come and, you know, and that's what it was like. And I, I mean, I was still earning a living 
working with athletes and working with the general population for, you know, the typical goals and, and this and that. Um, you know, your, your 10 sessions for, for this, for this, you know, the typical personal, personal training type thing as well. Um, but I had, I'd amassed all these transformations and I was refining my process as it went on and on and on. And I just kept getting better and better. And then in my own, in my, in my late twenties, I went to America to, um, to train with a bunch of UFC guys in an effort to try and fast track a notion I had about becoming a mixed martial artist. And, and my new website went up and my friend convinced me to put all these transformations on it. I wasn't going to, because I was like, well, it's not really the point. I'm a strength and conditioning coach. This is something different. He says, listen, just put that on it. There's people out there. So I did. I didn't check my emails for a month because I'm training with people like Robbie Lawler and Matt Hughes and all these guys. And I came back about a month later, <laughs> and I opened my inbox and there was literally about 200 requests for can you do that 12 week thing to me you know there was people from other countries even saying i don't care how much it costs i don't care how far i have to travel i want it i want the results were so dramatic and that was the start of it that was the start of it so then that, that's how it became a business and it grew to mythical proportions in belfast hundreds and hundreds of people done it and this this, along with my connection to the Hardstyle Kettlebell community and being in certain books um, that Pavel and Dan John, who you had on your show, um, had authored and being in different things and writing articles and this and that, it all kind of drew attention to one place and everybody's seen these transformations and we started getting inundated from coaches from America and Europe and England talking about coming over to pay, to intern, to this, to that. So that's when it became an online, or that's when it became a certification. And that's an online certification. It's it's in its best form ever. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary story. And you would have had, you know, like the Pied Piper, you would have people just coming to you. <laughs> and then we spoke briefly before. We it was like the Pied Piper without the pipe. It was like, yeah. it was playing its own tune yeah. and they were just coming, yeah. you know? So, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, but it, but it really leads me to that question I alluded to right before we press record, which is, you know, what makes a successful candidate for the A12, for example? So the A12 will take pretty much a person from all walks of life, whether you're, I mean, it's one of the reasons I've got it within my business is because it, it creates a certain amount of certainty. Um, and you could be 65, you could be 25, you could, you could have injuries or whatever, and it, and it adapts based on the individual. But what, what, what particular qualities do you think people who succeed on the program have or what do you want to instill in those people that might not have them okay that's a great question and there's a few different perspectives that you can answer it from I'll, I'll attempt to touch on them all so in the most literal sense what makes a a somebody who's appropriate for having the potential to become an a12 graduate is a heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> right i mean I, I don't mean to be flippant about it but if you are a human being with with opposable you know thumbs and, and all the, the the anatomy that we're, we're um, used to associating with a human being and even if some of it's missing but you have the mentality to dedicate yourself to what's going on you will do it the program will create the result if you stick to it and that includes the diet Okay, and you know what? Here's the truth. And I'm gonna tell you, you're an A12 coach and you're, everybody here is a coach of some description who has maybe handled diet, let's say, or um, I don't know, some sort of exercise prescription for the client to do when they're on, you know, when they're not in your site or whatever the case may be. I'm not sure if anybody who has ever done the A12 program, I'm not 100% sure if they've ever done the diet. Right? That's, I don't live with them. I don't know if they're doing it, but I suspect they are when I see the results, okay? Now, but here's the, the honest truth. I'm also equally certain that, that it's, it's unlikely that a high percentage of them have, have adhered 100% to the diet for 100% of the 12 weeks. However, there is a direct correlation between adherence in the gym 
adherence at, at home with the dad, um, incorporating that into your lifestyle in a holistic and accepting manner and the magnitude of the result. I mean, it's one for one direct proportion. Okay, the, it's, 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 it's one for one. So to answer it, to answer it more completely and to not be a cop out and say a heartbeat, I would say someone with the capacity to realize that this is a finite investment for a lifetime return. Because what you're going to learn in 12 weeks, you'll be able to take with you for the rest of your life. It's going nowhere. You're going to learn how to eat better for you in a very maintainable way, right? As you know, there's no macronutrients, i.e. food groups. For people out there listening, things like carbohydrates, proteins, fats, that are ever totally missing, you know, from, from any one of the 12 weeks. It's never totally missing throughout those seven days ever, right? And it's oftentimes, oh, you know, 100% present with every meal, you know, throughout large chunks of it. And the nutrition is structured in such a way that I believe it's the best maintainable diet for a hundred percent of the people out there. I'm not trying to come up with a, a diet for a genetic outliner in his twenties who is training to become a physique competitor on a stage. There's aspects of what that person needs that everybody needs if they're trying to have accelerated muscle growth and, and fat loss. But there's aspects of what they're willing to do that we shouldn't be asking the general public to do. They're, even we sh they don't even ask themselves to do that 365 days of the year because it's unrealistically maintainable. It's not the way a human being eats. It's the way a human being eats for a purpose, right? So don't be thinking and don't be worried that you have to be somebody who's as mentally dedicated as a pro bodybuilder or like a Shaolin monk and there's, there's going to be, you know, all these fasts and we're going to cut out whole nutrient groups and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. No, you're going to be eating carbs. You're going to be eating regular food. You're going to be eating it every day. You're going to be, um, you're going to be eating it every week. You're going to be doing it. It's going to be something that is maintainable. The phase one, as you know, that comes in three phases. Okay. The phase one of the A12 diet, I would defy any human being on the face of planet earth to not be able to maintain that permanently for the rest of their life including the cheat day, you know, where you can literally go at it, right? And that's every week, you know? I mean, how easy do you want something to be? It's as easy as something difficult can be, right? But it's not going to be the way you're eating now because the way you're eating now has led to what way, has led you to the point that you feel you need to do something about it. So there has to be a change, okay? So you need to accept that there's going to be, you need to be someone who can accept that there's going to be a process, but that that process is finite and that it's, it's, going, to, it's going to become more difficult towards the end. And then when, when it's over, you have something that you can be proud of for the rest of your life. And you've got a blueprint that you can, that you can use. Um, it's easier to keep a house clean than it is to build it, guys. Do you know? There's a lot of effort involved in building that house, but keeping it clean, keeping it tidy, maintaining it, there is less. So it, it, it's, it's an investment literally in the health, body, mind, cliche, soul for the rest of your life, okay? Um, so yeah, you have to be a human being who's willing to, to make a change. The training as well, isn't much like the dad, is surprise it's not the easiest thing in the world because comfort is a relative terminology and i know paul you're going to understand <laughs> that having worked with me on late to be fair right let me get slightly sidetracked i train paul for gs right which is gervoy sport which stands for kettlebell sport right which has to be and james has a bit of experience with that as well and peter is a hard style kettlebeller kettlebells in general are tough gervoy sport is sent from satan <laughs> I love it, but and you've been assisting him, haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> you know, let's ask where the red beard comes from. Look, it's starting to look like a pitchfork. Look, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, listen, 
it is one of the hardest things in the world to make comfortable. But comfort is a relative terminology. To me, it's it's about proximity. We're getting a bit into a bit of, of how to train here, but that's okay, I suppose. It's a bit of it's about proximity to maximal um, capacity. Okay, so it, it's not necessarily easy, but it's not. It's still comfortable if you can do more, particularly if you can do considerable amount more. But it's but it, you know, it's not relative to the amount of pain that you're feeling. Does that yeah. make any sense? I say pain with a small p. I don't mean injury. I mean you know the typical things that are associated with the inorganic phosphate ions building up in the muscles and the, and, and the burn, the burn, so to speak, quote unquote. Like when I did that forty presses with forty kilos. You, you watch the video, the last rep still looks easy. I, I, I firmly believe I could have done maybe 60 reps where the last rep would have been like this, right? But if you think that didn't hurt, you can think again. <laughs> <laughs> that was burning like a son of a bitch from almost the start. I'm very fast twitch oriented. So I have to utilize the rack position to try and neutralize that natural physical tendency of my physiology and you know it's a main game from from 10 reps onwards but i know my body can do another rep and relatively easily so comfort is a relative term um but yeah the a12 is not a diet or a program that's going to have you with no energy and you know busting busting your 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 knuckles to the bone and, and grinding out reps and, and all these things. You're not going to be training to deliberate failure that much, if you know what I mean. Um, people, sh- thing is about it, what I've noticed is yeah. that people are generally ad hoc when they become initial clients. They're just kind of like, you know, when before they become clients of the A12, maybe they've trained a bit, they've done a couple of weeks here, or maybe they've even trained four days a week but they've never trained with any purpose. Mm. And I think quite quickly, the first couple of weeks are a bit of a shock to the system because there's a bit of soreness. There's a lot of information they've got to learn. But by about week three, they suddenly realize it's like, well, I was sore yesterday, but I'm here today. And then I'm here Mm. the next day. And I still do it. And I'm better than I was the week before and the day before and the session before. And it just, it kind of reconditions the mind. It's like going through army camp in a way. (laughs) Yeah. suddenly realize like uh, under, under stress, I just revert to training, you know, and that's what I've learned from you is it's like, oh yeah, this really, really hurts, but I kind of know it's going to hurt and it's kind of kind of got used to it. And then I recover very quickly because I'm not emotionally attached to it in any way. Yeah. Whereas so you're, was- you're a different person, a different person physically and mentally. Um, and I applaud you for that because I'll tell you, GS is something that no matter how comfortable you want to make the program and it, it breaks people, but you touched, you touched on something there, which I, um, was wanting to work in when we're talking about when we were talking about why earlier that transforming the body has has this inexplicable ability to also transform the mind and the emotions well it's not totally inexplicable it can be explained um, and the reason is quantifiable success on a consistent basis that's one of the one of the one of the things that and I'm not saying don't go to therapy because therapy is great and if, if there's people who need that for the mind, they should absolutely do it and do it as much as they need it. But one of the shortcomings of therapy, of um, you know, psychology, is that it's hard to convey a tangible result with intangibles. It takes a skill to do that. That's why people need to be psychologists. And I can't just turn around and start talking to somebody and make them feel better or help them solve their own problems. Okay? So weights solve one of those problems physical training and the a12 in particular because it's a concurrent program which sees many things happening good at once you're building muscle you are losing fat and you are doing it at the same time and we can talk about that that's a, a bit of a fallacy that you can't do that to any significant degree you absolutely can and there's there's been actually nearly nine thousand active case studies now from the A12, which show proof positive that muscle has been built while fat has clearly been lost. However, and I can talk about why that's a mathematical certainty. Um, Well, the fact of the matter is there's loading parameters 
which create muscle growth and they're well known you know that certain within certain uh, volumes and certain rep ranges if you increase uh force production uh, if you're if you get stronger within those within those uh rep ranges or loading parameters that are most conducive or most closely associated with muscle growth your muscles will get bigger almost even in spite of what you're eating because your body will find amino acids even from incomplete sources right your body will obviously you can do it more optimally if your diet is optimized as well but if you are getting sick, there is no way, right? Let's say we take something bog standard three sets, 10. Okay. If you get stronger, if you're lifting 80 kilos for three sets of 10 on the bench press on the 10th rep of the third set, you couldn't have got 11 if somebody had to put a gun to your head. Then that was your three sets of 10 rep max, not your 10 rep max, because you did three sets with it. Okay. If in 12 weeks, 10, that's a hundred kilos regardless of what you were eating, regardless of how much body fat you lost or didn't lose, your muscles are going to be bigger. Simple as that. It's a mathematical impossibility, right? They don't necessarily have to be bigger if we're talking about a three times three rep set because that's not the loading parameters that are associated with muscle growth. That's more to do with absolute force, relative strength, things like that. But guess what? Your three rep max, your every rep max has gone up in direct proportion to your three times 10 rep max because it's a mathematical impossibility for it not to. If you improve your any rep max, you improve your every rep max and that is quantifiable, right? If you have managed to do this, and here's the big if because most people find it hard to do this, but if you manage to do this while in a calorie deficit, while becoming progressively fitter um, in aerobic and anaerobic conditioning-based workouts, you will have built muscle while simultaneously losing fat. It is a mathematical impossibility for those two things to have not happened. Does one inhibit the other? Yes. But to what percentage is entirely up to the optimization of how you've manipulated the mathematics around that situation in both training, concurrent training, on that. So, so that, that quantifiable confidence builder that you see with the, with, with training in general, with weight training, that, that can't be gotten from a verbalization of trying to work out your problems with somebody. That's great. That's brilliant. Right. But if we're talking about self-confidence, you know, obviously improving on the bench press isn't going to, isn't going to, you know, get rid of every dark demon in your, in your closet. But a lot of people have self-efficacy issues, right? That that lies underneath, you know, this person bullied me when I was at work and this person bullied me when I was at school or I don't feel great about myself in this environment or this and that. A lot of it is, it might not even, they might not even think it's physical or what way they look physically and it might not be, but it's a self-efficacy, a self-value thing that originates from somewhere where there's something they don't like about their face something they don't like about their mind, something they don't like about their body, something they don't like about their speech, something they don't like about themselves in social situations or how they interact with the opposite sex or whoever it is, right? Whatever, right? It's still related to the value that they place upon themselves. And if you make someone stronger, their self-value goes up in that regard and it crosses over it slowly spills over, like you fill that glass and there's 10 other glasses. Eventually it spills over into all the other glasses once you've filled that one, until you've filled them all up, right? I have never seen anyone who has made a dramatic physical improvement who hasn't also transformed how they feel about themselves because it's, it's literally what people start treating you different when you look physically different. Maybe they shouldn't, maybe they shouldn't, but they do. This is a physical fact of humanity, okay? You can, you can bury your head in the sand and say that people don't do certain things. We have evolved to react certain way to people who physically look a certain way. And there's a very good um, anthropological reason for that that's based on survival and propagation of the species that dates back millions of years, actually, but at least the 200,000 that we know Homo sapiens to have been genetically as we are, largely. 
um, and that you're not going to be able to erase that with, you know, positive affirmations. It is what it is, and you should take advantage of it. Take advantage of it, right? There's nothing wrong with it. You're a human being increasing your self-efficacy through knowing that you have improved the amount of strength that you have in your body and what way your body looks inevitably because of that has a magical way of crossing over into absolutely everything. And the reason it does is because it's undeniable. I can tell you till I'm blue in the face that you're getting better. You're re really made improvements this week, Paul, you know, how you're, you're handling yourself or James or Peter, you've really made improvements in how you're handling yourself with, and you know, when that guy said that thing in work, you reacted to it the right way. Listen, if it was 80 kilos on the bar at the start and it's 100 kilos on the bar at the end, I don't have to say anything. Okay, the, re the, the mathematical reality of, of, of the environment that you're existing in is giving you all the information you need. You are better at that. And that automatically makes you feel better about everything. And the A12 is amplified in that regard because it makes you better at that, i.e. strength. You're looking in the mirror, coming out of the shower, you look way better aesthetically. There's a second thing, okay? Cardiovascularly, you're running for the bus, you're running upstairs, you're way better there, which might not necessarily be the case if your bench press went up. Sometimes it can go the opposite way because you put 20 kilos on because you also put 20 kilos on. If you know what I mean, my bench went up by 20 kilos. So did my body with I add 20 kilos in KFC to help that happen. So the, the A12 enhances the physicality in so many different ways that it lifts the psychology up, up, up into the stratosphere somewhere because it's quantifiable. I can see less fat. I can see more muscle. I can see it. Do you want to know why? Because here's the pictures. And that's why the pictures are important. Here's something I want to say to all your future A12 graduates and all the future A12 graduates around the world or all anybody, regardless of the A12, right? If you're going to start a physical journey, take a picture. Even if nobody sees it but you. In fact, especially if nobody sees it but you. Because you want to, you need to know if you're somebody that exists inside a headspace of you can't ever see the good that you're, that you're achieving, right? Then you're going to need to have some undeniable quantifiable evidence of that because I've seen people, we've seen them. I'm sure you've seen it on the A12, uh, the private group where coaches will come on, even coaches that have transformed their own bodies and, and, and they come on and say, I can't really see it. I can't see it. I'm getting so much stronger. And then I'd ask for their numbers and it's like insane. And I'm like, no, I don't know that I've, that I've built any muscle. I don't know that I'm, that I'm losing any fat. My clothes are getting a bit looser, but I can't. Listen, just wait for the pictures. Don't take them now. Wait till the end. And literally, universally, without fail, it's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, like, whoa. It's, it, it's, it's dramatic. When you put that before, the very first guy, my friend who I'm talking about, knew he changed, but didn't know how much. Didn't have confidence. Right to the end, he doubted himself. He did. And when he seen the pictures together, even my jaw dropped. My jaw dropped. Do you know? The legs in particular. <laughs> I mean, he had skinny, skinny, skinny legs. And it was just these thigh sweep and tear drop. And, you know, it was like insane the difference. So take the pictures, even if they're just for you. Would you say, Paul, do you think that the way you're talking about the A12 and, and, and most people who may be just recreationally at the moment go to a gym or they're trying to get a little bit better, but there's not that, <clears throat> you know, quantifiable improvement. Do you think it's that, that the benefit of actually having a start date and having an end date and almost like an athlete is training for an event and you've got something, you've got something you're aiming for and something that's concrete and it's a, a it may be the photo shoot at the end or the finishing date. Is it that really that kind of fires up people and gets the fire going, do you think, and keeps them on track and motivates them? A hundred percent. It does so for a few different reasons as well. Um, well, they say the best way to improve at anything is to compete in something, right? Let's, let's, let's start there for a second and I'll weave it in. Without a shadow of doubt, 
you know, if anybody here has ever competed in any sport, you may have been training that sport or doing exercises that are um, roughly applicable to that sport, which by the way, I have a surprise for you, Paul. <laughs> We're going to do something. Um, and, and you're going to see the dramatic increase. It's like from day one, it's like, boom, there's a date, there's a date. And, you know, I'm going to have to pay the paper on that date. It lifts your game to a whole new level because you know, that's why it's important to commit to the pictures from day one if you're going to do the A12. Because other ways, it'll still have a potent effect, but without a shadow of doubt, it's going to lose an edge. They don't have to be public, but they should be semi-public. They should There should be a day where you're coming in and there's at least one other person watching it happen. There should be a, that accountability. And that will be enough. The more public, the better because it will really focus your mind, right? And even if at the end you decide, I don't want to go public with the pictures, I'm massively happy with them, you'll be more happy with the results because the results will be better because you've been driving towards something that you know is coming, right? That, and here's one of the things about the A12, it doesn't happen alone. There's a transformation team now, it can't be guaranteed because it's it's obviously subject to how many people want to train at a certain hour in a certain location or whatever the case may be. But I'll say this, it works best when there's three or four people in a, in a, in a transformation team. It works better than if there's one. Um, at least two is better. Okay. it can. I've still done tremendous transformations where it's just me and the other guy but it does work better if there's more than one person in the team. I liken the A12 team to a sale, okay? And the, the, the potential graduates, because they're not graduates yet, you have to earn it, that's why we call it a graduation. The candidates are, are the mitochondria, or they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're the mitochondria, so to speak. Um, and and, and that, 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 that coach there, he has, to keep, he has to keep all that focus. He has to be the nucleus. He has to keep all that, that cell working together as a team. And they all help each other. There's not one mitochondria who jumps out by itself and goes, I'm going to do, go this alone. <laughs> you're, you're inside the cell. And that accountability, not just to the coach, but to your transformation team, your peers. Because sometimes you look at the coach with an elitist view, right? Even if it's not true, even if we're all flesh and blood, right? Maybe the only difference, I, I've lost count of how many people I've trained who ended up ultimately, not within the 12 weeks to be fair, but ultimately becoming stronger than me, without a doubt. I, the, one of the, the, third, the third ever A12 graduate went on to become the highest totaling Irish powerlifter of all time, right? The first Irish man ever to squat over a thousand pounds in competition and they ever deadlift over 800 and they ever bench press over 700, right? I'm not as strong as him, okay? Right? He's a super heavyweight powerlifter. He was in his prime. Um, and, and, and I've trained others who have been stronger than me in, say, the bench press or one of the lifts or this or that eventually, okay? It's not about the coach being this untouchable deity type figure, but it does start off that way in the minds of a lot of people. So when you've got that group around you, who isn't that, who's on the same boat as you, right? It just it amplifies everybody. You know, you, maybe you don't want to do the that, but you know what your fr your, 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 the, the friends and your transformation group are, and you don't want to let them down because most likely the graduation day, which I always try to do with transformation groups, is to have their graduation day on the exact same day and maybe within their photo shoots back to back, right? Because they come in like a team and it's the atmosphere. You could cut it with a knife. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's tangible. They're helping each other through the graduation workout, which is essentially just a pump up before the pictures, but it's seminal. It's a seminal moment and they're coming in and they have more confidence and their friends are standing beside them. And it's a beautiful thing. And in the 15 year history of this program, I've lost count of how many people from Belfast and I've, I've spotted it happening around the world as well in the seven years or so, six years or so that it's been international and global. I've lost count of how many transformation teams who have stayed together, either complete or semi-complete and are still training partners with each other to this day. 
you know? So that's something you're not going to get by signing up for, you know, the local global gym where you go in and nobody talks to each other and um, you're just, you're lit there. You know, <laughs> it doesn't inspire greatness when you know that the business model depends on as many people as possible paying for a membership and then not coming. <laughs> that, that's what everybody knows at the PLCs. That's how they make most of their money. They are dependent on, on the motivation factor of the summer and of January uh, New Year's resolutions to peter off within three to six weeks and for as many people as possible to keep paying via direct debit and to not go, right? Or we'll sign them up to a 12-month contract. What? Or we'll sign them up to a 12-month contract there and then, and then you've got the money for a year. So You've got them whether, whether they come or not or whether they want to, want to keep coming or, or not, you know? Which is so, what happened during the lockdown. I mean, uh, we're all in this third lockdown in the UK. In Belfast, you've got a lockdown at the moment as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's Stormont here runs ours. It's a bit separate from Westminster. Um, but yeah, we're in complete lockdown. There's the only thing that's, that's open is food stores, you know, food. That's it. And have you, I mean, you, you, you now run the A12 as a business that kind of works directly with trainers, but are you... I mean, are you still working with clients? Uh, I mean, I know you're working with me, um, but um, for example, are you start? Are you having to deal with that lockdown uh, mindset that a lot of people are dealing with at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I have online. I, I train. I train a select group of, of people online. I like to keep it between certain numbers um, so that the quality stays high. But my own capacity keeps going up and up. It's that. It's, it's that human calculator head of mine plus I'm quite organized in that in that regard um, but the online clients are often fitness professionals okay and and they own gyms you know and I can see it affecting their gyms and, I'm, and so they're my clients so that's affecting them which affects them being my clients and things like that so I have lost a couple of clients to fit pros who, who had to close their gyms and they lost their source of income. It's a horrible time. Uh, you know, it has been horrible in 2020 and 2020, but I can, people are starting to adapt and they're starting to get around it. Um, and if you can stick with your coaches and train at home under their tutelage, it's way back. I mean, that's what I'm doing with you. And look at the progress you're making. Look at the progress that, that all the clients that I've been working with have been making. They're all coming from like 32 kilo one rep max presses to tame in the beast with the 48 kilos, do you know, or 40 kilo or, do you know, I've got a girl who this week, I'm going, to, I'm going to be putting a post up about her hopefully tomorrow because today she's going to press the 20, I'm, I have full confidence she's going to press the 24 and she started off her one rep max was 30 pounds um, and then that's now 53 pounds, right, which is 23 pounds but it's more than just that percentage ways that's insane yeah you know what i'm saying that's an insane percentage of, of what her one rep max was i am expecting she might even be able to get two with this because the other day she did a triple with 50 pounds <laughs> i've got the video right her one rep max pistol was zero pounds on her left leg and 13 pounds on her right and now she can wrap the 53 pound bill on both legs right so this is what can be done if you stick with your coach. If you have a coach, you know, um, and these three guys here get my absolute highest recommendation, by the way. And if, 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 if anybody's being coached online or in person by any of these three guys, you're very lucky. You're very, very lucky and don't let go of it. That's what can be achieved if you stick with your coach. You're going to continue to progress, especially with the technology that we have around today we're talking here now as if we're in the next room to each other and we're all in different locations um it can be done human resourcefulness is, are, is why there's seven and a half billion of us on this earth despite three or four near extinction events over the course of our evolution and the course of the history of our species um this is nothing compared to some of the things that humanity has come through and you know yeah some of the clients aren't fit pros and their gym closes so we have to switch to a different program at home that's more body weight based maybe they have some kettlebells the equipment doesn't matter even if it's zero equipment it doesn't matter your body is a piece of equipment 
the, the things around your house and your natural environment is equipment. Anything that weighs anything is a weight, okay? We can make this work. Yes, your body weighs a certain amount, but you can adjust what percentage of your body you're lifting by doing certain clever tricks here and there. You know, I can't do a push-up. Okay, we're going to do a version of a push-up you can do, and we'll progress towards that push-up. And guess what? We can progress towards a one-arm push-up, and then we can start looking at ways to make that harder, okay? I have to laugh when people say I'm too strong for body weight training. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. You know, everybody on this call right now instantly burst out laughing because of the guy who knows that to be utter bullshit. Okay. I consider myself a reasonably strong individual. I am nowhere near too strong for body weight training. Okay. There's always something you can do to make your body weight represent, and I'm not even talking about odd and weight to your body weight, which makes it easy, which, which can be done, okay? If you've got a few weight plates, it can be done. If you've got a couple of bricks, it can be done. If you've well, we were talking about weight, that. It can be done. We were talking about a video that you released with, uh, that had Ollie Quinn in it about seven or eight years ago, and you're doing oh, some great. crazy handstand between two yeah. Or something, you know? Yeah, I put two 32 kilo kettlebells on top of two 15 inch benches. And then went into a handstand and started doing push ups where I touched my head to the ground. I tried to get it as far to the ground as I could. It didn't get to the ground, but it, it ended up getting to the point where my forearms were parallel to the floor. So only inverted, if that makes any sense. And then pushing up from there, you know? So yeah, and that was a two rep max at the time, or two or three or whatever it was. So and I mean, I could have banged out 30 handstand push-ups on the ground with, with you just touch your head, forehead to the ground. So there's always ways to make something harder. Um, and you don't need any equipment to do it, guys. Don't let, I don't care how many times the gym shut, shuts down. Stick with your coach because you're going to need, you. It's, it's, it's of your benefit that you keep him in business because when this is all over, you want somewhere to go. Because you've been stuck inside the house looking at four walls, getting bored, you know, <laughs> being bored, let's <laughs> say, <laughs> bored, right? And now you want to do something, you want to go somewhere, you want to get your blood moving. Oh. Guess what? The gym, you want to keep them open. You don't want to be one of those PLCs that never go out of business because they don't care about people. That's why they're not going out of business because they have deals in place where you don't have to be there for them still to make money. Yeah, I saw there was something about that, about um, a certain a certain coach who's doing uh, PE sessions and all these people <laughs> doing, like, the online stuff for millions and millions of people. Yeah. Um, and it was like, well, that's all well and good. But they've already got loads of money. They've, you know, they don't, like, they don't care. They don't know your name. They don't know how many kids you've got. They don't know who you're homeschooling. They don't know what struggles you've had as you've come along. They don't know anything about you. Whereas, and I get this with my guys, we're doing it online, you know, and like today it's like, how's the homeschooling going with the kids? Oh, it's been a nightmare and, and all that. But they're still here doing it online. They're still finding an hour in their day. Um, yeah. You know, and it's like, so how's work been and all of that sort of stuff. And like, you don't get that from a PLC yeah. gym. You turn up, you, yeah. you, 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 you don't even know you've been. Yeah. Until they send you an email in 12 months time to say, do you want to renew your membership? Yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> not even them sending the email, it's automated. Yeah, it's exactly. They're doing it because it's designed to do so at timed intervals. But yes, I know exactly, no names mentioned who, who it is you're talking about. I've, <laughs> I, I know who it is you're talking about. But, you know, I've spoke on the same, on the same event. as I, I was on the same stage as that particular guy before um, in Dublin. He's a really nice guy. And I don't doubt it. <laughs> I, I, listen, there's a, there's a lot of things that he doesn't that he doesn't know and he can't know from, from that platform. But there's also some things that he probably should know that he also doesn't know as much as some people who aren't as famous as him, right? And I don't mean to, to be disparaging in any way because I still think it's a very positive thing that him and people who have that platform do something like that because there are, listen, this is about helping as many people as possible and having him in that position is great. Is it ever going to be as good as something that either one of you three guys could do on a, on a personalized face-to-face -face basis? No way. Especially the scalability of some of the stuff that they're doing is either vastly too easy or vastly too hard for whoever's watching it. It's like sort of sweet spot stuff that's better than doing nothing but scratching your, your, your behind. 
Um, and I still think it's good that it's happening. But yes, you need to support your local coach because individuals of that level aren't really doing, are, are, are going to be rich anyway. Um, and, and you don't want your local gym to go out of business because you're not going to be able to positively think and, and burnt yourself <laughs> yeah. do a few random bouncy exercises back in the shape after being in lockdown for several months you're going to need your, uh, a trainer who cares about who you are with real programming and and real um team spirit the trend to optimize your results so there was um a reese uh, i wanted to just i'm aware of the time we, and you know we've had an awesome awesome chat but there's a couple of things that i wanted to bring up with before, before we let you go, we're going to hold you captive for the entire day. Um, <clears throat> before Christmas, where there was an A12 coaches meeting where you announced a, an adaptation to the A12, which was for me very interesting to hear, because one of the other questions that I had from one of my clients was, well, what happens if you can't dedicate five days a week to training? What happens if you, if you, can't, uh, you can't follow the kind of set parameters that the traditional A12 has I mean and, and you came up with an answer to that so I'd, you know could you tell us a bit about that I will indeed there's actually a couple of things I want to I want to say and you're, you reminded me of the other one by reminding me of that one and they're both quite poignant at this time so first of all yes what you're referring to um, is a newly developed program that we have termed the A12 Express so what has been what has been traditionally known as the A12 program excuse me excuse me, <laughs> is now known as the, a, as the A12 or Amazing 12 Classic, okay? And there's going, to be, there's going to be subdivisions of the A12 going forward, ones that make sense. We're not going to, we're not going to dilute. We, if you want to do anything well, it's better to do less things really well than loads of things, you know, average. So if you look at like a Michelin star menu, or, or these types of things, there's always a limited menu because you know that the chef can deliver on those things really well. And he's not going to be pushed fingers to the bone with 20 different orders of all this different types of stuff throughout the evening, okay? It's the same with everything. Less is more. Specialize to optimize. So the A12 will keep its offerings few, but we are branching out just a little. And the first branch of that tree um, well, the tree itself is the A12 Classic. The first branch off is now going to be the A12 Express. So the A12 Express carries all the same quality of the A12 Classic, but it's condensed into a, a smaller work period. It's 35 minutes, three times a week, and that is it, okay? That's a, an hour and 45 minutes per week. Okay, the A12 Classic is around five, sometimes slightly more um, hours per week. So an hour a day, maybe slightly more, depending on your um, the condition that you come in. You may not do slightly more, but the A12 Express is 35 minutes, three times a week, full stop, an hour and 45 minutes per week. If you can't dedicate to that, then you're telling yourself, you're telling yourself lies. You know, anybody can find an hour and 45 minutes a week you know, and it's all encompassing in that we already have results that I've actually personally done with people that show that the quality is very high from this. It's from the makers of the A12, i.e. me, um, and the technology behind it. If anything, this is a better, it's the, it's, it produces the biggest results pound for pound. I'll qualify that out of any body, tra body transformation program on the face of the planet including the A12 Classic. Now, those who are familiar with strength sports will know the terminology, relative strength and absolute strength, okay? Pound for pound strength and most weight on the bar. In terms of biggest results, absolute, it's still the classic. But in terms of rel results relative to time invested, it, you know, if you just did a sh uh, 35 minutes of the classic three times a week, you wouldn't get the results that you're getting from 35 minutes, three times a week of the express, you know? And then I've had the question, well, then why don't you just apply the, the express program into the classic and make the classic even better? Well, that's not what way physiology works, gents. Why doesn't you see a bolt just, just sprint uh, at a pace of 
five nine seconds for a marathon and do it and thinking you know you know why doesn't he do a marathon in 35 minutes it's not going to happen that's not what way it works you have to pace things differently for different results but this is the usain bolt of body transformations and the quality is that high you know and it's going to be good there are a lot of people out there I don't accept reasons like, oh, you know, I don't think I'm good enough for the A12. You are, because it's super scalable, the classic. It's super scalable. It can take somebody, trust me, I've designed the program and behind this to dynamically, dynamically program based on the information on, a, on a, an exercise by exercise, day by day basis for an 80 year old grandmother or an Olympian, right? I actually, at the upper end of the strength protocol, I actually had people like Addie Hall and Hathor Bjornsson in mind for realistic, uh, and then went beyond that again, the future proof it, okay? This will keep going no matter who you are, and it will go down and scale no matter who you are. Um, because doing something five times a week, by the way, is something that everybody can do because we, we, everybody does something seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're all alive. It's just what the scale of what is the expectation of that is what has to be scaled. Okay. The magnitude, that's all. Once you get again, the mathematics behind that correctly, anybody can go five times a week, but logistically some people can't and, and we're missing those people. The A12 express for people who are time poor, you know, but enthusiasm rich, those are the type of people that do the express. We will not miss you anymore. We have got your back this time. And not to let COVID or anything else ever get on top of the A12 or, or what our coaches can, can do with our clients. There's another reason to stick with your A12 coach. There's another reason to stick with them. And that's because the A12 at home is coming this year. The A12 at home is coming soon this year. And this will require zero equipment. And it's not going to be a typical bounce about and do your thing. This is a serious bodybuilding strength, body transformation program that can be done with no equipment in any environment and will, will deliver strength and, and muscle that is comparable to the A12 proper in a very different way. The programming is completely different, right? But the strength and the strength for reps that this delivers, which reads as says on fat loss is, is unlike any, like no equipment based training program that has ever been written. And I've, I've read them all. I've read all the best of them as well. All the best books out there for like body weight related stuff and things like that. This is completely different than any of them. This is a heavyweight strong man. If a strong man and a bodybuilder became one thing um, and needed to be scaled for everything from grannies to Olympians and had no equipment, it would be this, right? That's what this is, okay? So you can expect to get super strong, super jacked, super quick with no equipment whatsoever and just your, your, your everyday home um, with the quality of the A12 behind it. And that's what, that plus the Express plus the Classic is what we're coming at the world with in 2021. Awesome. And it's worth just saying, I mean, we talk about strength a lot. We talk about human potential. It can come, we can think when we talk about strength, it can put, put, put a lot of people off. But what I've noticed is that the A12 is incredibly popular with women, particularly, who actually want to take control of their health and be really strong. You know, this, this idea of, you know, I'm going to get too bulky. Really, what we find with the A12 is people just look absolutely awesome. And, uh, and whether you train at home, whether you train on the A12 Express or the A12, what I've noticed is it, it's, it's more than strength. It's more than muscle. It, it's just releasing uh, that potential within your body. And everyone looks fantastic at the end of it. Absolutely. Uh, can I say something briefly on, on that, on women and strength training and the A12 and some of the fallacies and um, myths that have been surrounding that for the longest time? Thankfully, the raise, the astronomical raise of physical culture in the last 10 years or so has helped put pay to many of those old time myths that were related to that. But we do and we will still encounter that as strength coaches and as body transformation coaches with the A12 and different things. And 
to all the women out there, there is a micro percentage, a micro percentage of females who have the genetic ability to gain muscle at the same rate as even an average man. It's just, there are physiological differences, right? We're all equal in value as human beings, but in terms of ability to gain strength, men have real evolutionary physical advantages over women, hormone related, um, that happen during uh, adolescence, that have effects on bone density, um, fiber type, fiber amount, okay? Um, all sorts of things, and it even affects the brain, okay? There's, 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 there's a bone structure, physical structure, tendon strength, you know, red blood cell count, myochondrial density, everything. There's, 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 phys, there's phys, physical differences in a man's ability to look too big in terms of what way a woman doesn't want to look that the vast majority of women simply, no matter how much stronger they get, aren't going to replicate that, okay? They're just going to feel better, look far better, and end up looking like who they are who they should be in the first place because Western society, men and women alike, has transformed us all into something that we actually weren't meant to be if we were existing in our true natural form. You know, that's down to the diet, it's down to the activity levels, it's down to the stress from work, it's down to the artificial environments, it's down to everything, okay? The, the real human, the real human animal, if we look at an animal in a way, we look at a tiger, we can expect to see something the way it looks. And if we look at a hundred tigers, we can expect to see something similar. Okay. They're all going to be, they're all their stripes are going to be different, but they're all going to be tigers, right? We can do that with every animal on the planet apart from human beings. Okay. <laughs> but if you put us all and, in our natural and, environment. And dogs. And dogs. Yeah. Because, we, dogs. because human, we've human dogs. dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, well, well, here's an interesting thing. There was a study done where they put a group of dogs um, on, a, on a, a, an island and fed them, kept them alive because they wouldn't have been able to keep themselves alive. And three or so, gener all different breeds, like three or four generations, then they all started to look like wolves, like more and more like wolves again. It's just the, the genetic, the genome returns to type once selective breed, you know, starts taking place and this and that. So if you take a, a human from this artificial environment, uh, you're, we're never going to go back to the cave, right? But the best way to do that and still reap the wonderful rewards of, of, of modern life is to try to replicate, you know, older eating habits, older activity levels, um, and, and expect more of the body. So women should expect more of themselves because they're capable of a lot more than, than maybe they believe, maybe an individual person believes, um, and don't fear what your body can become when it's doing the things that it was meant to do in the first place. The only thing you're going to end up doing is revealing the real you, not the new you or the better you or love you for who you are. Great. Love yourself for who you are. Just be 100% concrete sure you know who that is, you know, because a lot of people have never met themselves. They've never met the real version of themselves because they've never lived a human life um, as it was meant to be in a way that would reveal their true identity as it was meant to look, if that makes any sense. So yes, love yourself for who, for who you are, um, but make sure that's who it actually should be, who it actually is. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's fantastic. A lot of what you've been talking about as well, Paul, we had obviously Dan, Dan was on last week and he, and one of his big things was, uh, you know, deprivation builds capacity and, and the way that in lockdown, you may just have one or two kettlebells, a TRX or body weight. And it really, like you, like you were saying, you know, you can do a hell of a lot with that, can't you? And you can really, uh, you know, there's no end to, to the results you can get with limited equipment. You don't need, you don't need a lot of anything. You don't need anything at all. But the less, let me put it to you this way. Singularity of purpose is a very powerful thing. Singularity of purpose is a very powerful thing. And, you know, too many options creates confusion. Do you remember, I'm going to talk, I'm going to listen, I'm talking to the, to the men in their 40s now, right? Which is us, I'm assuming everybody, right? <laughs> I'm assuming everybody. Um, 
we had four channels, guys. At one point, we had three, right? And we looked forward to certain shows at certain times, and we never missed those shows. Now, as much as I love all the variety that we have today, and as much as I wouldn't change it, um, doesn't it become a bit mind-numbing when you're looking at all those films? Films who used to really look forward to seeing at Christmas. I used to always buy the Radio Times. <laughs> Not the yep. TV Times, funny enough, the Radio Times, because I like the cover. And we would go, and it was better inside. And I would, I would I always love to look forward to the Christmas movies that were coming up. Really looked forward to them. I still buy the Radio Times, but it's, it's more out of habit, the Christmas. <laughs> you know, it's like you don't need it. You can go on your phone. It's, it's everywhere. And you see the films that you want to see at Christmas all year. Mm. And it ruins it because you have too much variety. And you spend 20 minutes at night trying to figure out what you want to watch, what you want to yeah. watch. Half an hour trying to figure out what you want to watch. You know, if you've, got a, if you've got a gym full of stuff, you don't know what you want to do. If you've got two kettlebells, you know what you're doing and you do it. And sometimes it doesn't matter and you enjoy it, God damn it, and you get the result. The same way we got the result back in the day when, it, when Crocodile done D2. <laughs> 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 right? It's every day at the moment. I you saw know, on every week. Either the Krypton Factor or Crocodile done D2 and you were like, listen, I'm going to watch Crocodile done D2. Absolutely. Here's a thing for you to watch. There's a guy, I think he was called Brian Schwartz. He did a TED talk on the paradox of choice, which is what you're talking about. And he, he used jeans as an example. So when he was younger, he, there was one type of jeans, one type of pairs of jeans, right? You put them on. Once. They, didn't yeah. fit that, they didn't fit that well, right? But once you'd worn them a bit and worn them for a while, they'd mold to your body and then you were fine. Yeah. Next time you went to buy a pair of jeans, they were like, do you want boot cut, slim cut, this cut, that cut, you know, all this time. He was like, yeah. your head comes to used to be up. the only ones. And then, so yeah. he leaves the shop with his pair of jeans with higher expectations that they're going to fit better. And he's still disappointed because his expectations were raised, but he still comes out with jeans that aren't right. So it's, that's true. Yep. It's true. You know, and we're doing it to ourselves. I think it's, I think it's actually most prevalent when it comes to entertainment viewing. There's just so much to see. It's like nothing impresses anybody anymore. And, and, and our kids as well, I fear for them. I try to try to keep it, and give them a real education of watch these movies and watch them in this order and don't be watching them. You know, watch one this week and watch this and the other one next week. And trying to build those same sort of um, delayed gratification based childhood memories that I have because that, 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 can, that, that, that that's not just about watching films. It goes into every aspect of your life, you know, and less is more almost universally. You know, because again, like we were saying, specialized to optimize. You know, if Usain Bolt was a decathlete, he would never have been Usain Bolt. Might have still been a great decathlete, but he would never have been Usain Bolt. You know, and some people's specialization is generalization. You know, a world champion decathlete tried to be Usain Bolt, might have never been anything. You know, so it's finding what you, it's having something that's worth doing, and then it's just doing it, and it's as simple as that, you know. Well, I mean, I I'm, I operate out of Daily Thompson's facility, so I have a space. So there's a, you know, is he still drinking Lucasade? I remember yeah, those adverts. Yes, I bought him Lucasade. He yeah. doesn't get it free. You think he'd get it free, but he, he does drink it. I bought it for him. Does he? Oh, he was nice. <laughs> I love those. And then John Barnes with the Lucasade Sport. Remember those? Yeah. You thirst fast. Boom! Boots it into the bin. Love it. So, <laughs> so it's a couple of things to leave leave this podcast is with. Firstly, I can now I now know that your children have not watched Phantom Menace before A New Hope. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That is very true. And then Dan John uh, had a question for you, uh, and I'd like you to ask Dan John a question as well because he's on next week. Okay. So, what was the question, James? Uh, the question was uh, when was when was when it, when did you see Dan John at his most uncomfortable? <laughs> Oh, flip. There is an answer. He's given us the answer that he... <laughs> yeah. Specific answer? Yep. Oh. Oh, hold on. I think I might know it. He was at... We were at a wedding. <laughs> but it, I think it yeah. might be right. Yeah. Yeah. Whose wedding was it? It was, it was Niall, Niall Greenan's wedding. Shout out to Big Niall. Um, he's an A12 coach. Um, yeah. 
we were at, we're, we're at Nell Greenan's wedding and he was judging a kettlebell competition between him and his son. Um, and I think he had, to, he had to say a few words and he had to be a judge and he had to be this and he had to be that. Uh, it was funny. Me yeah. and son, at, at that wedding as well, here's my question. <laughs> <laughs> We can ask him next week. And yeah, this one is great. Here's my question for Dan. <laughs> how many, how many people came over to him saying, "Paul McElroy sent me over with a question." <laughs> okay. What at that same wedding? Uh, yeah, I, I at the same wedding. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I told him at the start I was going to use him as a sandbag because everybody always asks me questions. And any weddings that I tend to go to are, are with people who are in my world. And it tends to be people in the physical world who are either athletes or coaches or some way involved with strength and conditioning. <laughs> um, and, and then so therefore their friends tend to be from that world as well. And I get a lot of questions and that's great. And I told Don at this wedding, I'm just gonna say, yeah, good story. Did you know Dan Jones here? <laughs> and, just, and just point them over his direction. So I want to know how many people I, I sent over. I know there had to be a few. Sure, we will ask him that next week. And was there something else, Paul, you, uh, Paul, uh, Bat, Paul Bassett, you were going to say as well? Um, no, because I've forgotten it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, generally at weddings, people glaze over when I start talking. Um, <laughs> But anyway, no, that's been absolutely fantastic. I mean, the thing is, uh, as, as strength coaches, I mean, I've, I've done your uh, A12 cert, and one of the things that I found when I first started exploring your work was like, how the hell is this being done? So I've got really geeky about kind of how you program. We haven't really gone into your programming approach, and that's one of the unique things that trainers come to you to discuss and uh, because you have a very unique take on that. Um, and that's something not really for this this podcast because really what we wanted to do was communicate just that the fact that you can make a fundamental change uh, and you you did that with great detail and and uh, I've certainly learned a lot and hopefully our listeners have as well. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank really you. Thank that. you for having me. I have a slight sense of dread of what you have in store for me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned to toughen up and I shall deal with it. Like nothing that. you can't handle, batting ball. Nothing you can't handle. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, James, do you have anything you'd like to finish with? No, just want to thank uh, thank Paul very much for coming on. I mean, I've seen you speak a couple of times. I think uh, um, maybe a Strength Matters convention and maybe an yeah. NPE one as well. We've met a couple of times. But, yeah, really good to, to have a good bit of time with you and to hear the history behind uh, everything. And I'll certainly look up... Um, uh, you know, the A12, uh, the online sort of certification stuff as well that you've just mentioned. How can people get, um, if people want to find out more about you, Paul, and, and, and stuff, how, where would you like them to go? Where would you like us to direct them to? Well, the Amazing 12, that's, that's 12, the number, 12.com, is probably the best place to find out anything A12. And there's a lot of stuff on there about me. There's, there's various videos for people to watch. There's some... You know, semi-educational videos of me doing face-to-camera lecture style um, talks on different points related to the fitness business, but also tr physical training and, and progress and different things. There's some snippets from some of the live certifications. So some wee pearls in there that, that people will be able to apply to their training. Um, there's also the Benchmaster program, which is on that website, which is, is a, a bench press related uh, program which I have out for for purchase which is super cool it takes some of the the a12 bench press technique videos and it puts it together with a completely unique program which is not only phenomenal for building strength and size it's also probably the safest bench press program you're going to be on because I actually originally come up with this program to help elite powerlifters who were having shoulder injuries with the bench, shoulder problems with the bench press. Guys who couldn't bench for more than a couple of weeks before a meet, who would have to do floor presses and board presses and bench press like stuff, but not the actual bench press. So I came up with this program to help them bench press, so to speak, for longer periods of time. And not only did they not hurt their shoulder, it tended to take they just were training pain free and they were getting so much stronger. So it was supposed to be like a sort of a rehab program and turned out to be 
like a real strength producer and they were getting bigger and stuff as well because I was keeping the rep ranges higher for um, so doesn't annoy their shoulder injuries. So that's a good one as well. And there, there's Instagram. I've only just started social media and things like that. I'm not big into it. I'm just Generation X trying to learn these things. And um, it's Paul McElroy, Amazing 12. That's it. So on Facebook, I know you can follow me on Facebook. There's a bunch of people doing that. I don't know who <laughs> anybody is, but God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Um, well, um, no, I've just like, thanks for coming up. There's one thing that I haven't mentioned actually, and it's your quote, and I use it a lot of strength isn't built, it's granted by the central nervous system. And I absolutely love that. I bloody love it because everyone's Thank got you. enough strength. It's in them. They just don't know it's there. And I well, this it. is it. That's, it's kind of what my, we could almost do another podcast on that. Um, it's kind of what my whole ethos is about. Um, there's a few different ways. There's a few different ways to get stronger that we know of, and we don't really under, understand them all very well. That that's something that's kind of covered up or, or or glazed over. That you know this this happens and that happens, and that, no, there's actually a lot of grey woo in there that nobody fully understands, and things that might be the case that and, and maybe aren't, and so on and so forth. But we put our best foot forward and say the things that we're most sure of to the degree that we're sure of them, and so increasing you know, cross-sectional thickness, i.e. muscle growth or myofibrial thickening with the same amount of neuromuscular efficiency is one way to get stronger because if all other things are equal, bigger muscle is going gonna, is gonna to produce more force than a smaller muscle. Now that has to be relative to the organism, i.e. if James's muscle gets bigger, James's muscle is going to be stronger than James's, James's bigger muscle is going to be stronger than James's smaller muscle was. Okay, that's not necessarily true for his muscle being bigger than mine and mine being weaker than his, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's neuromuscular efficiency, which is getting more juice out of the same amount of motor units that are innervated. And then there's this gray area, this phenomenon that seems to happen where humanity seems to be able to um, be capable of feats of spontaneous superhuman strength. Um, and, and then when we look into it further, we realize that most people, even when trying their hardest, can't contract, can't innervate more than 30% of the available motor units. And even elite weightlifters might not be any higher than 50%. But then you say, okay, well, then there's a 50% deficit there that exists at, at minimum. But we see things like, 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 like 100 pound women deadlifting the back end of cars that's a percentage of the car's weight, but it's still a lot bigger than her deadlift would be in the gym, you know? And then there, there was a, there was a, there, there's a guy quite famously, a rock climber who was dying of dehydration and was trapped under a rock. And there was limb, there was his, his, his chest was broken. There was multiple broken bones in his body and he was dehydrated because he was waiting. He didn't try to lift the rock. He tried and couldn't. And then he was waiting for somebody to rescue him and it didn't come. And he found the Herculean strength to essentially floor press this rock high enough for him to squirm out, right? Now, that was bigger. There's no way that rock weighed God knows what weight. And there's no way it was only twice what his one rep max bench press in a dehydrated state with broken limbs was. So there's a deficit that goes beyond even what we know of. And we don't fully know the capability of the human body, but we know that there's a trip switch that prevents us from hurting ourselves by using all of what's capable because we'd literally break our own bones. And we've maybe, Paul, it would be fantastic, uh, like you say, down the line to get you back on and maybe do a podcast yeah. on like maybe the mechanics of strength or... Yeah, you because know, going into that right now, we'd end up at four hours, <laughs> you know. <it's laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, um, maybe because we've got, like, we, had, we had Dan on last week and he's coming on again next week because he wanted to say, yeah. so maybe down the line we could do something on, like you say, the mechanics of strength and the actual science behind getting strong. Yes, that'd be good. Which would be, which would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah awesome. that's fantastic. I mean, because there's really, you know, there's so many podcasts out there. There's so much information out there. There's very little quality information on this on this subject. It, mm. you know, that's why we spend so much time searching the internet, being geeky about it, because you have to really try to find it. And sometimes it's in language which most people can't understand. Some of it's in Russian. 
some of it's kind of translated from Russian. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's <laughs> we just don't know, you know, because people don't always reveal. So, um, well, thank you once again. Really appreciate your time. Um, and those of you listening to the podcast today, please do subscribe because it helps us. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, YouTube, whatever. Uh, and please recommend the podcast to any friends. So lovely to see you all and take care. Thank you, guys. Bye. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.